Oh, I didn't see you there. Welcome to <laughs> welcome to Dreamful Guitars. My name is Chris. Behind the camera is Matt, as always. Welcome to episode 18 of the 3,000 year old guitar build. Here's where it is. We took it out of the um, out of the, the Go Bar deck, and uh, so today we get to do the very exciting thing and make it look like a closed box guitar. So we're gonna pull it out of the mold. And then we are going to remove all of this overhang wood that's on here, remove all the tabs and everything. And then what we're going to do is level the sides and begin prepping it for its binding, purfling, and abalone. So that'll be super exciting. So I guess while we're here, we'll just go ahead and remove it from the mold. <laughs> Plus I get to flex on my cool mold still. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, it's just a simple, I have my spreader, my spreader in here. So uh, I just thought of this, but for those of you that are maybe just getting into making all your jigs and tooling, one thing that you need to be sure of before you get too married to anything is that your spreaders fit outside of the sound holes of the guitar. Ask me how I know. <laughs> <laughs> so test out when you're making any of your spreaders or anything that they actually will fish out of the guitar after it's all closed up because I have gotten these stuck in a guitar before and then had to take chisels and like slowly whittle down the wood like through the sound hole to get them out. <laughs> But uh, we we'll do that. We will pop out, uh, pop out these um, my dowels. Sorry, sorry. For the money shot, <laughs> pull that out, and there it is. So, as you can see. What you're going to end up with, for those of you following along at home, is you're going to end up with all of this extra material on the guitar. And that's good, right? We wanted to have that on there just as kind of like insurance to make sure that we have enough wood and we don't have any gaps. But now what we need to do is trim all this off. And you can do this with a chisel if you'd like to. That kind of gets a little sketchy. What I use is a flush cut uh, router bit uh, and just kind of just run this whole thing around the guitar and get the guitar you know, roughly cleaned up, and then it's finally gonna look like the basic outline of what this guitar is gonna look like. So we'll do that. And I use that with a kind of a janky little jig over here that I have set up on my table saw. <laughs> it is not um, uh, professional, but we're working on that. It's, one, it's like, <laughs> it's one of the last things that I haven't like spent good money on getting like a nice router lift and a router table all set up, but uh, don't you worry. <laughs> I will be getting it. So we're gonna get moved over there, kind of rearrange in the shop and get this all set up. And uh, I'll show you how we go about just trimming that off. Okay, so once again, my crappy little makeshift router table here. We have just like a little, um, what is this, a rigid? Yeah, it's like a rigid laminate router that I have just kind of temporarily set up over here and it works pretty decently. It uh, does the job. This is kind of one of the very few things that I use just in a router table for. Um, so. Pretty self-explanatory, we have a, um, a flush cut um, router bit on here with the bearing on side of it. So what it's gonna do is ride along the sides here and just give us our nice cut. But I do wanna have an opportunity to mention to you folks who are really just getting started with guitar building because you can really screw the pooch here if you're not paying attention to grain direction. We're gonna do a, a future video that kind of gets much more into depth about grain direction because that can be, uh, there's a lot to talk about there. But in this particular sense, there's a rule in woodworking, especially on the tops of your guitars here, where you always wanna be routing downhill. And that can seem a little bit confusing for folks um, but once you kind of get it in your head, you have like an aha moment. It starts to make a lot of sense. So what we have on a guitar top especially is this perfectly straight grain that runs, you know, the length of the guitar top. And if we were to just take this guitar and just kind of spin this thing around, you know, by, by getting on here and just going like this and all in one direction, what's going to end up happening is that you got to remember that the router bit is spinning in a clockwise direction. Am I doing it? I'm doing things backwards now. Yes, it's spinning in a in, in a clockwise direction. So what we want is to be falling downhill on our guitar as we spin. So I want that router bit to be kicking up this way so that it's falling down the hill because what happens if you don't fall downhill this way and you were actually coming uphill, what's gonna do is that router bit is gonna wanna take these pieces of grain and rip them out. And you can actually just rip a giant chunk of wood off the top of your guitar. It's like you've come this far, and can you imagine, now you just, you have to do this giant repair. 
and it happens to people all the time. It may not be as dramatic as a full giant chunk of wood getting ripped out, but you are gonna get tear out down here at the end. So just remember, you always wanna start at the highest points and then go down to the, to the low point. High point, low point, high point, low point, and then fall down to here. So you kind of divide the top into eight sections. So it'll be like one, two, three, four, and then the same thing on the other side. So just, just something that I wanted to kind of touch on. You're gonna do the same thing on the back side. I know that that can seem confusing, but like I said, we are gonna do a much more in-depth video about it. So um, there are a lot of videos on the interwebs about that as well. And the more you do it, the more intuitive it becomes. Um, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna put on all my PPE and we are gonna, uh, we'll start with the top and then we'll do the back of the guitar. Oh uh, yeah. Safety glasses. <laughs> nice. All right. So that can be dramatic looking, I'm sure, and sounding if we had too much audio on there. But once again, don't have the dust collection set up on this yet. But uh, you can see now we have our top really nicely cut out. Um, there was a couple of moments on there where you could really feel it and see if you're paying attention to how that router wanted to kind of catch that wood and tear it out if you weren't going in the right direction. So what we're going to do is rinse and repeat on the opposite side. Something a little bit different about this side, you got to remember, is that there is a bow on the back. You know, we built that into the guitar, so it doesn't necessarily want to sit flat. Whereas on the front side, when we laid it down, it's laying pretty parallel. Um, but what we end up on here is it not being perfectly parallel. So that is something, that's the reason why we have binding jigs and all of that stuff to compensate for the back being bowed. So what we're doing here is not quite needing it to be perfectly cut. So we're not gonna consider that too much, but as we come around this section here, I'm probably not going to have it laying completely flat. I'm gonna let it sit up just a little bit because I wanna keep that perpendicularness or I want to keep the, the router a bit parallel with the sides. That's what's important. And so we're just going to do that and knock off the back. Um, same thing applies though with that, that grain direction. Uh, you might even find it um, useful for you to do this. Is Let me go grab um, a pencil real quick. Something that can be useful for you um, is you can literally, there's no shame in it, just draw arrows from the top down on, your, on the guitar just as reminders. You know, these are going to be your points where you're going to be doing that, uh, the, the dropping down, just to help help you remember to do it because you can really mess up and it would suck for you to get this far and mess up um, with something so simple. Because learning how to read grain direction is something that just takes time for it to become intuitive and not have to think about. So I don't want to harp on that too much, but it's just, it's, it's one of those things that can just bite you without you even realizing it. So we're going to do the same thing on the back here and then... It's going to look like a guitar, and I'm super excited about that. All right. So for the uh, internet police come on to us, we normally would have dust collection set up on this, but we need to be able to show you guys what it looks like so we can't have like a giant dust collector sitting on here. So, nobody comment on that. <laughs> but yeah, man, you can see how good it looks. It looks like a guitar now, right? I mean, for the first time, we're finally seeing it all come together uh, and I'm just super stoked. So, you don't really get a good sense of what it sounds like just quite yet because there's little gaps where the binding pop or where the braces pop out. But, Kind of a couple things I can show you what we talked about in previous episodes when we were talking about notching these pockets here for the braces to come to the sides. You can understand now why you need to not notch that too deep because it has to be enough that the binding is gonna cover all of this up. So I think you can visually see that now, including here on the top, like where the X brace pops out. Um, it's just you need to have, so for me, I think it's like a four and a half or five millimeter um, binding that I have. So it needs to be no more deep than that. But uh, so the next step that we need to do is now prep these sides for the binding. And so very similar to how we cut off those sides, the binding tool that we used on the router, it rides along the sides of the guitar. 
it's that's its reference point is the is the sides of the guitar so what we need to do is now really take our time and level these sides to get them perfectly flat to get them flat this way if I use the pencil so that there's no gaps here but also just to get them super smooth because if they're not smooth, that binding channel is gonna translate that waviness into the binding channels and you're gonna see it. So this is a step where you really need to take your time getting it nice and level. It's also a step that I get a little bit of an advantage because of my laminate sides. My sides are much smoother now than if I had unlaminated sides, which you end up with a lot of waviness inside of it. So we're gonna kind of move over to the vacuum clamp and kind of clean up all this. And then I'll show you how I go about leveling the sides in preparation for doing the binding. But uh, yeah, man, first time ever we get to see what she looks like. Alright, so we're going to go over here to the LMI vacuum clamp, which, in my opinion, sucks. <laughs> <laughs> LMI cease and desist. <laughs> oh my god. So you can see, once again, this this is really where this vacuum clamp is going to shine, like, so good. This used to be one of my, like, most hated steps on the guitar because it's very sawdusty. Um, I used to not have the most important thing that I would recommend for this, which is the uh, pinwheel sander. Um, Elevate Luthery makes this. Grizzly Tools makes this, and I believe there are one other. We're gonna put links to these in the description. I'm gonna send most of you guys, if I can, to Elevate Luthery. They are a small business who I do recommend you support, um, make really good luthier tools, and uh, you can buy them on Amazon, but buy them from somebody who's making these uh, by hand. They have them in two different diameters. It's gonna really speed up the process. So use one of those if you have one. If you do not have one of those, what you're gonna to wanna to do is to have an accoutrement of different things. I highly, highly, highly recommend you get some spring steel. You can use this, um, you can get this at local hardware stores, you can get this from luthier supply places, but it's just flexible springy steel that you can glue or use adhesive backed sandpaper and put them on. I have them in different thicknesses and widths. These are going to be things that are going to be useful as well as some sort of block that you can use to, to just get on here and do some sanding. Um, but it's just, this is an elbow grease step that just has to be done. It's a necessary evil. And um, yeah, so what we'll do is I'm gonna start off with using this spindle sander because it speeds it up a whole, whole, whole bunch. I'm trying to think of things that we should make sure we mention here. Um, for those of you that are not doing laminate sides on your guitar, um, the biggest concern that you should be aware of is sanding your sides too thin. So if your sides are super lumpy and really wavy and you're really gonna have to do a lot of sanding on them, just be conscious of how much material you're removing because you can sand through. If you sand through your sides, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> you're gonna have to get creative with some sort of solution to fix it. Uh, that's a, I've never seen an inlay on the side of a guitar yeah. before. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's how the sound port was invented. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, you gotta remember that what we're trying to achieve here uh, is, is once again, like I mentioned, is very level sides, right? We're trying to get these sides nice and smooth. So it's gonna be kind of without even looking at it, you don't wanna feel any lumps. And the other thing that you're gonna wanna get is to not have any sort of gaps inside the light here as you move a straight edge around, making sure that you're getting these as flat as possible. So that's the overall objective here. The other thing that is incredibly important when we're doing this is this upper section right here. Obviously, this is where the neck is going to attach to the guitar. So you're going to want to get this area very, very smooth and get it, get this angle here as best you can to where you want it. Um, and once this area is sanded and leveled, you don't want to be touching it ever again for the rest of the guitar build because it's going to affect that neck angle. That's my advice. But um, because of this, what we'll probably do is a little bit of sanding in real time and then we're going to probably set it up, do a little bit of a montage so I can set up dust collection while we do it. Um, I'm gonna wear my respirator 
my dust, my, my like wood dust respirator while I do this. So when I talk, it might be a little bit muffled. But uh, before we get going, what I'm going to do is just kind of get this going in the waist area before I put the respirator on. And I'm going to do my waist areas first. The waist areas can be the most difficult if you don't have a, a pinwheel sander. Um, and just getting these guys nice and level. And so what I'm going to be conscious of as I do this is that I'm keeping this nice and level. I don't want to be getting at it at an angle at all. I want to make sure that I'm keeping it nice and level, not applying too much pressure and just getting everything nice and smooth. So what I'm going to be looking for is low spots. And what some people will do, I don't always do it, but what they'll do is they'll take a pencil and just go like this along the whole guitar. And what that's going to do is going to give you a nice readout of whether you have low spots or not. So you can, if there's pencil marks left, that means it's still a low spot that needs to be sanded. So you can use those as witness marks. Can I get a witness? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to let it rip. Take a chip. All right, so I wanted to stop real quick so I can show you. You can see that we are sanding all of this off, sanding all of this off, but there are low spots here where that pencil is still showing. So that's where that pencil becomes really handy to, to uh, I can't even really feel that low spot, but the pencil tells me that it is. Um, I was applying incredibly light pressure to that and just letting it ride on here. Just like every power tool you use, let the tool do the work. I don't wanna be pushing down on this. I just wanna let that glide nice and lightly on there. Um, so I'm gonna do finish this waist area up and then we will talk about I'll probably show you how I do like one of the upper bouts or lower bouts with the non pinwheel sander method just so that you at home who don't have that sander can can do it as well Woo. all right so that's Done. That's nice and simple, nice and easy. It looks super good. You can see how fast that was. You were shooting regular speed, right, Matt? Yeah, yeah. I mean, collectively, that was maybe 90 seconds mm -hmm. for me to do that. If you were not doing that, the trick is you have to use your spring steel and really get in here and try to do this waste area. And it's just super awkward. So you don't have to have this. I think this is like a $150 sander worth so much more than that as far as time wasted. So uh, definitely recommend that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate this and show you how I will go about doing this lower bout area um, with the sander as well as with the scrapers. Um, obviously card scrapers are super useful. These, um, these, these Stumac Ultimate card scrapers are awesome. So many people have accused me of being like a shill for Stumac. Listen, Stumac's like one of the best games in town. I know the tools are expensive, but I have bought every single tool that we have inside of this shop with my hard-earned money over the course of the last 10 years, other than the Diamond uh, Files, which we did a review of months ago. I have bought with my hard-earned money all these tools, so hate if you want to, but like, these tools are awesome, so kiss my butt. But uh, a way that you could do this without using this sander is that you can, a lot of times I'll start off with um, my my uh, scraper. Doing the same technique that we were doing with the router, we wanna always be going downhill because if I was coming uphill, I'm gonna have issues with um, the grain direction on the back of the guitar. But you'll start off kinda just falling off and hogging material. Now this is like nice because the ebony just works really well with this. It just does such a nice job. And so you can sit here and do this and get those sides nice and level. It just takes a lot more elbow grease. Obviously doing the same thing with just a traditional scar card scraper as well. This one's not sharp, so it's not gonna do anything. <laughs> but you would do that. Now the other thing that you can do as well as using your spring steel. The nice thing about this is these average out all of your high spots and low spots. And you can come in here and do this using different grit sandpapers. And so that's a way to do it. I wanted to show you this real quick. Um, is that once you glue on any sort of any grit sandpaper, you're not necessarily stuck with that. What you can use is hook and loop sandpaper, and then it sticks to the sandpaper on here. So then you can use, say like this is probably 60 grit, then I can take this 150 or 180 grit, and set it on there, and then do this, and then it works. So you're not stuck with whatever grit sandpaper is on the spring steel. So just a nice little shop hack there. 
and you can see how quickly that's going. It's going pretty good. It depends on the wood you're using. Um, maples and stuff like that, they sand pretty quickly. Ebony's like this are a little hard, but you can see how good it looks. This does not work quite as well as the spindle sander does at getting that perfectly straight edge, but I don't know if we can get Matt in there to see that. That's what you're looking for, is like no gap. You want that nice and flat. So what we're gonna do is just kind of maybe get some dust collection set up and do some B-roll because it's getting dusty in here and my bookers are turning black. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we will uh, just kind of finish this up. I think that I mostly got that set for explaining what we're doing here, right? Yeah. It, there's not, not a lot yeah. more to it. It's just a lot of, it just sucks. It's a lot of, a lot of work, a lot of elbow grease. Uh, elbow sawdust, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll take your time. The one thing that we'll, that I can't convey here because we're trying to keep this video short is how much time we're putting into this. I'll probably collectively put about 45 minutes. When I was just getting going, this was a, almost a full day job. Take your time, do it right, really make sure that you're getting it flat because remember that any mistakes or any issues that you have here are gonna show up when you do your binding and they're gonna show up when you go to do your gloss finish, really. That's the big one that people don't seem to think about. You apply a gloss finish to this and your sides are all wavy, it's gonna pick up in the reflection of that finish. So just take it and do it right here. So with that, we will do some sexy B-roll for you. So glad I'm beat and I, I use the pinwheel method and it still makes me tired. But uh, so we've got the whole guitar really nice and leveled. I don't feel anything at all, no issues whatsoever. The only thing that I end up doing is really taking my time here at the neck joint. What, what I have, and I almost always have, is a little bit of a lump right here because that's where those two pieces of wood join right in the neck block area. So I'll actually take a solid, this is a three quarter inch acrylic. And I come in here and I just really try to get this nice and flat. I mean, I don't want to make a flat spot. I just want to get it nice and smooth. Um, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. Certain models like OMs and a couple of other more like like Dreadnoughts almost have a flat spot at the top of the guitar. But uh, not mine. So I just want to get this super smooth because that's where the cheeks of my neck are going to sit, right on top of there. So this is like 60 grit. That pretty much did it already. We'll switch over to the 150. All right. Perfect. Let me blow this off real quick. So what we have is basically the entire sides now. I'm just gonna knock off some little fraying wood here. Pull this off. That's what we have is this guitar is really prepped up now and ready to go. Like it's perfectly shaped, no lumps whatsoever. Um, and it's ready to go for the binding. I think it just looks super nice. The back hasn't been sanded or anything yet, which is fine. We'll, t we'll address that in the next episode. But uh, I think that gets you guys the idea of what we're doing here. Something that you can do at home. If you don't have a vacuum clamp, then you have to come up with some other creative method to hold the guitar. This is, if this is your first time building, um, you're gonna start to realize that that always is an issue, is how do I hold the guitar? Work holding is always an issue in woodworking. So you can get online and there are, there are clamps that you can DIY yourself and come up with nice clamps to hold the guitar in place. Or you can just do it old school, like I literally used to like, hold the guitar between my legs and do the whole method like that. It's not the best in the world, but you can do it. Um, but just to, <laughs> the drift with full body work. Exactly, <laughs> buns of steel. <laughs> uh, you, you, you. Uh, like I said before, we started to do the B-roll stuff. Is just to take your time with it and really make sure you get it right. You're going to pay yourself dividends in the future. Future you will thank you. But um, yeah, glad you guys enjoyed this episode, what we say, 18, yeah, episode yeah. 18 of 3000 Year Old. In the next episode, we're going to begin doing the binding cutting on this guitar, and I'm excited to show you that. That's a pretty involved process and can be incredibly intimidating for a lot of people because now you've got this guitar that's like basically looks done, and now you're going to take a router to it and cut giant channels into it. So uh, it's, it can get sporty if you don't if you don't do it the right way. And uh, thanks for buying T-shirts for everybody, and we'll see y'all in the next one. <laughs>